Right. Uh, welcome to the Pushkin Club and to Pushkin House, and uh, we are delighted to see you here. And uh, uh, we are very, very glad to introduce two Russian human rights activists who came here especially from Belgium. They are from the Anti-Discrimination Center Memorial and how they are connected to uh, the memorial that uh, received recently a Nobel Prize, they will tell you themselves. So I will just... Uh, in, oh, they, they both, we, we share the native city with them, we, we all are from Petersburg. And uh, this is Stefania Kulaeva, and this is Olga Abraminka. And uh, uh, they will, between uh, them, they will talk about uh, their work, uh, maybe all together for 50, 60 minutes. Then you'll have about 30 minutes uh, or thereabouts to ask questions and then we're inviting you to have a free glass of wine uh, and uh, chat informally. So uh, let's greet the, the speakers. And, uh, uh, over to you and I think I'll probably go there. I don't need to be here, I'll come back. Okay. Oh, thank you very much for inviting us here. Thank you Masha and thank you everybody who could come and join us this evening to speak about human rights in Russia, maybe not only in Russia, because as a matter of fact, our organization is working regionally on Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Um, but mostly I'll focus on our um, activities uh, that uh, are rooted in our work in Russia. <coughs> our organization is called Anti-Discrimination Center Memorial or ADC Memorial, and that's important because some people start um, calling us just Memorial and that's a bit confusing because there are so many organizations that share the name. In general, Memorial is a movement. Um, as for Nobel Prize, I suppose it was given to the whole movement, uh, but uh, organization is rooted in Russia, but it has been already more than 30 years international. Actually, there are Memorials in other Eastern European countries have also been for dozens of years. And recently, or not very recently, appeared also in West European countries, in Germany, Italy, Czech, and France recently. Um, as you may have heard, a Nobel Prize was given to three... Um, uh, yeah. The, not the groups actually because Alice is alone, but actually yeah. to human rights activist, uh, the famous one of, um, from Belarus, now uh, in prison, uh, Alice Belatsky. He was nominated already when he was in prison 10 years ago, and there was a hope that he would get it in uh, 2012, but we're happy that he got it now. It's even more needed. Uh, in 2012, he was in uh, prison for political reasons and for um, being persecuted for his human rights activities. Uh, now it's not only him, but his whole organization and uh, leadership of it uh, completely. So he himself from prison made it clear that it's for the whole Vesna or spring movement. As for um, Memorial, we'll speak about that more. And um, the third one is a Ukrainian organization, and uh, it's of course playing a very important role now in uh, human rights uh, work, so much needed there. Uh, I've been connected to Memorial ever since 1991. I remember how it turned from Soviet organization into international. Actually, when Soviet Union fell apart, we were organizing in St. Petersburg, near St. Petersburg, the conference in 19. Uh, in spring, early spring 1992, making um, all these branches that happened to be already in independent, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Lithuania. Um, I was actually in charge of meeting people on the station, so I actually got to know uh, as a student at that moment all these organizations, and it was declared international organization. Um, later, uh, we have started um, youth group, a youth anti-fascist group within Memorial, 
and um, continued our anti-racist or anti-discrimination work uh, for very many years. Uh, we were issuing an uh, anti-fascist newspaper called Tumbala Laika and later anti-fascist motive. Uh, then thinking of uh, anti-racist work, we realized that it's very important to focus on Roma uh, because we've been working in Northwest Russia and uh, speaking about the minority most affected at that moment by racism, it seemed to be Roma. Uh, there were mm, naughty things happening, there were neo-Nazi attacks, uh, there were police ethnic profiling. And uh, that time I met Olga who knew Romanes and I was looking for a person who could join on uh, Roma rights work and uh, education also for Roma children. One of our big issues that we'll also speak more about later. And uh, that's the moment when we started our Roma rights project. It was still within St. Petersburg Memorial uh, that united at that time uh, three kind of activities. Um, historical, first of all, as organization is mostly maybe known and at least uh, originally it is um, meant to memorize the victims of Stalinism and uh, post-Stalin's repressions. Um, second, it was um, human rights work and third, um, it is social work with uh, people who went through camps, mostly Stalin's camps, but also some post-Stalin's repressions, and they needed actually uh, support, and especially in the very difficult times of uh, poverty and almost hungry years in St. Petersburg, there were a lot of just social aid. Um, we kind of represented the human rights work um, as our program, uh, anti-racist program, but um, later on we understood that it's difficult to combine it fully with all other activities and we uh, created our own organization and named it ADC Memorial in order to show that we are connected to Memorial, that we are from Memorial Movement. It was also discussed with um, other memorials, uh, also with the colleagues in Moscow but also to show that it is our focus is going to be discrimination. By that time, it's 2007, the situation has changed. And um, there was a huge migration from Central Asia and Southern Caucasus. And these people became big target of racists, uh, police abuse, and other um, violence, other forms of violence, including neo-Nazi violence. And our organization started to work also on migrants' rights. Um, we've been uh, doing big programs supporting um, migrants, also from fraud by uh, people who employ them, but um, as well uh, protecting their rights in many other ways. Simultaneously, we started to do other forms of anti-discrimination work. Uh, gender became a big issue. We've been doing work on women's rights, um, LGBTI rights, um, and um, indigenous people rights um, as well. The last change was in 2013, 2014, when our organization was one of the very first in Russia uh, to be kind of attacked by uh, prosecutors and um, police. We were uh, checked in um, February 2013, and they said that there are all signs of foreign agent activities, and the law at that time uh, obliged us to register as a foreign agent uh, organization. We completely refused um, to do that and had to liquidate our legal entity. Uh, that moment we opened a legal entity in Belgium uh, and decided immediately to start working uh, on wider scale geographically including other countries in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And that had a logic in some ways, because, for example, uh, we, being rooted in Russian uh, problems, we realized some issues that were not known in the other countries, but were also present, uh, like um, the problem of existence of list of uh, professions prohibited for women. This is an old uh, Soviet practice that existed already in Soviet Union, but later, uh, was unfortunately adopted by most of the labor codes of other countries. And not only in Russia, where we knew the situation very well, but we found out that in Ukraine, 
456 professions were uh, banned. Um, and in most of other countries, in all Central Asian countries, in all five of them, uh, and in uh, Belarus. And we started a campaign that we called All Jobs for All Women, um, trying to protect uh, the right to choose a job. The story of that uh, case is very important mm, for me. It was really, in a way, perfect human rights case because we were contacted by a victim, not that we had to fish for a case, as some people call it. And this um, was a really uh, great client, the best possible. She just Googled discrimination, and by um, doing a search, she found uh, that there is a discrimination organization, and she wrote us from Samara, that's a big city on the Volga River, uh, asking to help her because she's re uh, refused uh, by a <coughs> shipping company uh, while she had special education as a sailor but she was refused uh, because of this ban. Actually, honestly, this company wanted to take her, but they couldn't. They didn't want to violate the law. And we made the strategic case out of that. We went to courts. We um, uh, exhausted domestic legislation and went to um, CWN, um, Committee on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination of Women against Women. And, um, and committee gave a statement that this is discrimination, that this particular person is discriminated, but this list and all lists like that are discrimination. And with this decision, we could already go further. We started to advocate for uh, abolition of this list in Russia, and we very quickly switched also to other countries, where we had actually more success. Uh, it was easier to oppose this um, in Ukraine. Uh, it was a question of a few steps. We just had actually to raise awareness. When people in Ukraine, uh, women rights organizations, and even um, some members of parliament and the ministers realized that there is such atrocity that they didn't think of at all, they just uh, agreed that it has to be changed, and the list was abolished. The work has not been done till the end. We still need a change of labor code, but uh, the circumstances are not, of course, in favor of that now. Um, because the labor code says there is such a list that can restrict women. Um, but it doesn't say, um, without list, it cannot be used, this article. But of course, there should not be such an article. And then um, we also uh, were very proud of the result in Moldova, where they even changed the labor code and did it quite perfect. Uh, instead of that, making an article that no um, bans can exist for uh, gender reasons. And um, later we switched to a number of countries, and maybe do we have results of the campaign? Um, you can see that now in many countries there is already a um, uh, situation changing. And it's not only changing a theory, it is changing a practice. Like we know that in Kazakhstan, where they changed the law quite well, and in Russia, there are already hundreds of thousands of women working as truck drivers, train drivers, underground, uh, drivers uh, and um, some are working at ships and uh, other uh, mostly transport means. Unfortunately, the situation is quite bad still in Belarus, very difficult to change. There are a lot of completely ridiculous bans, like uh, even in agriculture, women cannot pick apples from a tree that is bigger than one and a half meter. And, <laughs> um, and we were also trying to oppose it theoretically because they said it is a protective measure. That's what also Russia claimed in uh, international court. It's a protective measure that cannot be seen as discrimination, which is true. Protective measures are not discrimination. But what does it protect? It protects maternity that not all women want. We had a client who was a transgender woman, and they fired her. She, she lost the job that she had for 12 years before when her, um, her gender in documents was male. Uh, obviously, not all women can have children, not all women want to have children, and these restrictions are discriminative. We also know that we always said that there are men who cannot, uh, whose reproductive function might be damaged by some job, and they are not uh, restricted. They have a choice. What do they want? Career or uh, money, uh, children? Women, uh, by this law, had no choice, and that we uh, saw as an important part of discrimination, violation of uh, women's rights. However, we think that uh, protective measures are good, and that's why we propose that when women are, for example, pregnant and cannot do certain heavy jobs, it can be temporary 
uh, replaced by some other activities with the same organization or same firm. This is one of our uh, important campaigns. Uh, I'll briefly speak about our other campaign. Um, it is uh, called Stop uh, LGBT Persecution in Chechnya and Donbass. Uh, we started it when we uh, issued a report after our own research in uh, Donbass in 2015-16. Uh, we realized that um, there was a very dangerous situation, threatening situation for uh, LGBTI and plus people. And um, in Chechnya it was already very well known and other organizations already were rising this issue. And we tried to unite it and to explain that this kind of um, extreme violence that is anyway taking place in, the, in particular uh, parts of Russia or and Ukraine in this case, uh, could um, cause also uh, special trouble for vulnerable groups. And we're again trying to raise this awareness now when we know that there are a lot of things happening wrong uh, right now with the new uh, aggression um, wave with occupation, but also in Chechnya where mobilization causes um, new forms of pressure on LGBTI plus, and that I am ready to speak more if there are special if there is a special interest for that. And the last campaign um, that I have to speak about is um, the most recent one. Uh, it's called uh, the first we just called it cross border childhood uh, because we've been working on migrants rights and we realized also that there is a systematic problem with migrant rights in the region. Um, due to the wrong international agreement that Russia actually imposed. Um, and it's called Chechnya Agreement um, that uh, declares that children who ended up in migration in some situation became unaccompanied minors. Usually they didn't come unaccompanied, but they lost them, but did who took care of them. Uh, these children uh, have to be brought up, uh, brought back by police. And actually they have two forms of uh, immigration detention. First child usually is detained, for example, in Russia, and then police brings him to, for example, Tajikistan, and child is detained up to 30 days, and sometimes even prolongation is possible. Again, sitting really behind the bars, waiting for a solution in the native country. And the same back. For example, child was detained in Ukraine and brought to Russia and detained again. Um, the only countries that changed it uh, too much better um, concept is Moldova, but they couldn't actually change it in practice because you need at least two countries to have a better result. So we very much worked on uh, Ukraine-Moldova new agreement. Both governments were ready to sign it, but at that moment the uh, new um, aggression of Russia happened and in uh, 2022 we focused on Ukrainian children in migration. There are millions of them now, and the new campaign we call Cross Border Childhood What to show that it is for Ukraine. Um, speaking about this campaign, um, is there more? Uh, we try to choose uh, the most important issues that have to be ensured and, the, and guaranteed as right for a child, like safe environment. Um, not separating with a family, not only parents, but also other members of the family, because many children from Ukraine come not with parents. Um, of course, education, psychological care, and health. Um, we also especially advocate for minority rights. That's why this kind of childish picture shows a, a symbol of Roma uh, and Roma rights and the other um, a figure is uh, showing a handicap because there are also a lot of children with health issues and handicap that need special uh, care and attention and proactive measures. Um, this campaign uh, and the special uh, focus that we've been already working for years anyway, uh, children in closed institutions and how um, the transportation and the welcome of such children should, uh, take care, uh, sh should be arranged, including uh, actually children prisoners. Um, this is um, important not only in Eastern Europe. That's the first time that we are actually working directly on European Union and other European countries, actually including UK, because uh, we um, find out that not all 
rights uh, of children who came to Europe uh, all were secured. Sometimes some countries decided to separate them with the grandparents or maybe older brothers if the children came without parents. Some countries uh, didn't provide actually school, to my big surprise, to children older than 15. For example, in Germany, they said that the basic school is for children under 15 and those who are 15 might not be taken to school. Mm, some uh, countries, uh, of course, failed to uh, give special protection measures to minorities and, for example, Roma is also not so easy. Uh, and to end my part of a presentation, I would like to show uh, the cartoon. Uh, we made a kind of animation documentary with real uh, children's voices recorded by a psychologist and you can hear them in Russian Ukrainian and read uh, in English. Thank you. Мне 14, и я из Арпеня. Мне 7 лет, и я приехала из Днепра. Мне 13 лет, и... 14. С Киевом. Нам сестра сказала, то, что вот уже началась война. Я сначала ей не верила, а потом мне прям в ушах начали слышать какие-то крики, расстрелы, какие-то вопли просто. Мне, мне начали слышать звуки войны. Утром мы спали все, и прям где-то очень рядом прям пахнул взрыв такой, прям вот как будто ракета прилетела, ну там ее, наверное, сбили, либо что-то еще. И у наших соседей окна все прям просто вылетели. Ну, я дуже злякалася в перший день, тому що е, ракета впала недалеко від нашого будинку. І я прокинулася не від того, що мене розбудив батько, а від того, що мої пташки е, почали дуже сильно і нетипово для них літати по кліці і битися на їх стінки. Ну, десь полтори неділі кожен там 5-10 минут сирена. Мы в коридоре идем до сирени. Потому что там несущие стены. Папа не заставлял меня в Барселону ехать. Он спросил меня, хочешь ты в Барселону или нет. Я ради безопасности только поехал. 24-го меня как-то ну, накрыло от прям такой хвилы. От у меня от в якийсь момент просто вимикаються всі емоції, тобто біль, страх, от все просто вимикається, і я просто як машина починаю збирати ці речі. Приймати рішення швидко, найголовніше. Я сказав, що треба одразу йти в магазин, ну, тому що вже з самого утра ми два часа простояли утром, щоб купити їду. Я взяла з собою рюкзак, планшет, одну білочку і одну собаку. Ну, мы сначала поехали на вокзал вообще, чтобы просто посмотреть. Ну, мы, ну, мы уже с чемоданами поехали, но просто чтобы посмотреть. Э, мы думали, что будет очень большая очередь, и мы вообще на поезд не сядем. Э, но там кто-то кричал, что есть поезд до Чопа, еще есть места, и мы побежали. Это был ужасный поезд. Мы ехали на поезде. Папа меня провожал в окно. Там орали постоянно, вот мест почти не было. Мы с одним мальчиком менялись, типа, ну, остальные. Мы немножко, мы немножко. Мы езжали три дня, хотя если бы не война, мы бы доехали до Польши за три часа. До, два, одну ночь и два дня мы стояли в пробках. Когда мы выезжали с Ирпеня, мы поехали к мосту. А его, оказывается, взорвали, и нам пришлось, нам военные сказали, что надо ехать на другую дорогу. И когда мы туда приехали, уже стояли другие военные, и они нам тоже сказали, что уже туда нельзя. И у нас только там был последний шанс выехать, это там одна дорога через весь Ирпень, так в объездную. 
один раз у нашего водителя заболела голова. Ну, это было еще ночью, и мы остановились. И мне вот было страшно, что сейчас от, откуда ни возьмись, выйдет там танк какой-то или что-то такое. Сон страшный. Там про зомби. Самое страшное. Мы своего котенка отдали, потому что у него не было паспорта. И то, что все уже мы уже не вернемся, если, если война не закончится, или если упадет ядерная бомба, то мы уже не вернемся. У меня есть хомяк еще живет. Он у папы пока. Папа говорит, показать тебе хомяк. Я говорю, конечно, давай показывай. Там еще наша рыбка живет. У мене три дуже звичайні бажання. Це щоб закінчилась війна, піти у музикальну школу на фортепіано, бо мені дуже подобається цей інструмент. Вернутися в Україну. Ну, во-первых, я б хотіла, щоб війна закінчилась. Я б загадала, щоб повернувся папа. Ну, щоб війна закінчилась, щоб ми повернулися в Україну. Щоб закінчилась війна. Щоб Україна процвітала ще більше. Ну, загадав, щоб війна закінчилась. Все стало так, як було до війни. Построїли все. Try this 90 second trick to instantly reduce your winter energy bill. The situation of Roma in the former Soviet countries are, mm, is actually more or less the same. It's rooted in the Soviet policies on Roma. And uh, uh, as human rights defenders, we call this situation uh, structural discrimination. It's a kind of a vicious circle started with the, mm, starting with the lack of docu personal documents, lack of good education, um, uh, uh, bad job, extreme poverty, as we see here in very poetic picture. Um, and again and again and again. And uh, how, how it happened? And um, for people who love Russian literature and know the <laughs> this stereotype of uh, Roma dancing, singing, and so on, it's uh, sometimes strange to see uh, this contradiction between the uh, Russian literature and Soviet internationalism, friendship of nations and peoples, and this current situation of extreme poverty, and marginalization of the Roma in Russia. Uh, 
1956, there was a law adopted in the Soviet Union and after uh, in some other countries like Hungary and uh, uh, Romania, for example, to stop the nomadism and traditional way of living of Roma. And they actually were given uh, land, pieces of land, and some constructive materials to build houses. But at that time, nobody cared about the uh, legitimizing of this property, about houses, pieces of land, and nobody uh, cared about uh, the growing of the future growing of the community. And uh, half a century later, we see such um, quite chaotic <laughs> settlements, which uh, 50 years ago were situated in the outskirts of cities, in villages, but now actually quite near from the center <laughs> of the cities. And uh, um, if you look at a map, there is empty place there, but in reality, uh, hundreds and thousands, thousands of people live there for decades. And we have a lack of goodwill from the state, lack of positive approach to them. The authorities uh, speak to Roma on, in a repressive manner, in, in the concept of this approach is uh, repressive. Uh, on this picture, uh, you can see the typical typical uh, settlement of Roma who live in such Roma-only settlements. You see uh, quite uh, uh, more or less good <laughs> good constructions, uh, in, uh, and in between you see a wooden, more or less tempor uh, look, temporary looking, but actually is a normal house of a Romani family, big family. And on the right picture you can see the uh, um, the demolition. The demolition uh, of such settlement, uh, we, uh, during our field work, we uh, had visited dozens of them in Russia, it's about 50 or 60 maybe or more uh, throughout the country. Um, and um, normally there are a few houses legalized, they have papers for their land and uh, houses, and absolute majority is so-called illegal, but inhabited for decades. Uh, we um, we d uh, insisted on uh, positive measures on, uh, about housing, uh, a kind of housing amnesty and campaign on legalizing of such settlements. Uh, but um, um, recently, uh, this wave of demolitions uh, raised again. Mm -hmm. And here you can see the consequence of such, uh, the results of state violence. This is the result of demolition. And on the right picture is non-state violence. So this is the result of anti-Roma pogrom in Siberia. So Roma uh, often in Russia are uh, victims of uh, racist uh, violence. Um, and the most uh, terrible sign of discrimination, it's visible and absolutely uh, definite, it's segre segregation of Roma children in so-called gypsy classes. Uh, the, the, uh, normally, the schools where dozens of Roma children come, they don't know how to work with them, with such uh, many children with a different language, uh, with a um, different culture. You can see here the uh, gypsy class is in Tula. Mostly, you can see boys. Because uh, family, uh, families uh, often also support this misconception of uh, education. And they say, uh, Roma, say, this is our tradition. Not to go to school. Uh, our grandmothers, grandfathers, they 
know how uh, they know how to count, how to write, and this is enough. And uh, with great pleasure, the schools say, "Oh, this is your tradition. We respect. Um, we respect how wonderful uh, tradition, and and as a result, mostly." children from such Roma only settlements, they uh, finish only um, primary schools and can't, uh, can't go further. If even uh, they, uh, they want to. Because the quality of education in such gypsy classes, they sometimes are called the class C from Tsigan. So, uh, and it's written on the door of the class. Uh, the quality of education is extremely bad. And on the right uh, picture, you can see Stefania in a street of a Roma settlement in Tatarstan. At that time, we decided to learn uh, what, what knowledge actually children have from school. And um, it's sad <laughs> to say, but um, many many children uh, don't uh, can't can't read or or write after some years of uh, such education. Um, sometimes children of ma of different ages uh, go to the same class, and it's also, of course, a violation of the right of children to education. And in Russia we have a state policy or even state strategy of inter-ethnic relations and uh, uh, nas national policy. Um, and what place the state uh, propose, proposes to ethnic minorities? Uh, they uh, often call it folklore nations. So uh, the authorities and uh, the society uh, accept, accept them as dancers and singers according to the deeply rooted stereotypes, but neglects their rights. And the same, I should say, about other ethnic minorities and indigenous peoples. Uh, in Russia, on the right picture, you can see the dancing uh, people of, of North. It's said in Russian legislation like that. Um, so they are dancing, they are presenting their culture in this way. Uh, but uh, when we are talking about their rights, we see that uh, they are violated. And we are, if uh, we are talking about the mm, Indigenous people, it means that the, mm, uh, the industry, uh, the companies, the mining companies, absolutely uh, destroy their uh, traditional lands. And as a consequence, language is dying, uh, the, uh, the skills, uh, how to survive in such uh, environment are dying. And the people as a minority uh, disappears. Uh, often the uh, national minorities, ethnic minorities, um, are victims of manipulating. Here you can see the dancing indigenous woman showing the symbol of this Z, uh, the symbol of the military operation in Ukraine. And it was a flash mob for, uh, among many ethnic uh, ethnic folklore groups. They uh, uh, they publish such pictures in the internet and so on. Uh, so uh, this is one part of the indigenous people who are li who live in Russia. And on the right picture, you can see the. Uh, representatives of indigenous peoples of Russia um, who had to flee uh, from repressions um, and they live now abroad yeah, because of uh, repressions. Um, 
and we uh, have a close connection to the indigenous uh, um, people of Shor, of Shortsi in Russian. Uh, they live in South uh, Siberia, and their lands are very much affected by open pit coal mining. You can see here absolutely destroyed uh, landscape. Uh, and now I propose to um, uh, to watch a short movie made, but our, uh, made by our uh, colleague and friend Yana Tanagashova. She is a representative of this shore indigenous people, and she had to uh, emigrate with his uh, with her family. Um, and and uh, ask for asylum in Sweden uh, due to political repression rela uh, related to her indigenous activism. I miss home every day. I wonder how they're doing there in far off Siberia with the dust, the black snow and coal. The coal slowly flowing the rivers. Coal. I hate. My name is Yana Tanagashova. I'm from Kuzbas, the coal region of Western Siberia. I left because of persecution and threats. In 2018, my husband, children and I were forced to flee Russia and request political asylum in another country. I belong to the shore people who are indigenous people of this region. There are only 12,000 of us left. The region has a population of almost 2.5 million. It's everywhere, all around. The open pit mines, open coal mining, explosions, dust, black rivers, foul taiga, a battle for life. Do you know what pain is? What coal is? These are synonyms for me. Do you want to know how coal is mined in Siberia? Ten stories about coal. That was the first story. Yana created 10 stories about, the co about coal, and uh, if you are interested, uh, you can uh, watch it um, on, our, uh, with them, um, on our website. Uh, but uh, the, coal, uh, the curse of coal <laughs> is uh, not the only problem of the shore people. Unfortunately, uh, another... Um, uh, the, the, their land is rich uh, of gold, um, in alluvial gold, uh, which is excava excavated from rivers. Uh, and now in Siberia, we, uh, uh, we have uh, this gold fever. <laughs> so um, um, we, uh, we cre uh, supported the creation of a documentary movie um, about the alluvial uh, gold mining in uh, South Siberia. And I propose to watch two short fragments and to listen to the indigenous uh, representatives who are talking about um, their lands affected by the alluvial gold mining. Вот на данный вре, данный момент у нас речка загрязненная идет с, с января месяца, как они заехали за Латари. А сейчас и рыба еще исчезнет. Ну, исчезает. Я вот ходил в тайгу, у меня там рыбы нет. Она же отсюда идет. Не знаю еще, дальше как будет. Понимаете, вот это все отражается на нашу жизнь. Что мы же питаться от, от рыбы и это 
там что два это в таких что есть, еще все же отражается. А норка, соболь, тоже они же все же питаются с водой. Возьмем даже вот, моралы, лоси, косули, медведи, они же все от воды бьют, берутся оттуда все. А где они будут пить? На природу же влияет. И с нами никто не считается, не хотят. Вот даже, вот, например, салатри, салатри сюда со, заезжали, а с нами же ни сход поселка, ничего же не говорили с нами. Ничего, абсолютно. Просто приехали, заехали туда в Илинка, и все. А мы даже не знали, что они туда, ну, в поселок Илинка туда заехали. Related to the uh, uh, the rights of indigenous people, but uh, now, uh, of course, uh, the dialogue between Russia and uh, the international community is very difficult. So uh, I think this is all that we prepare. Yeah, <laughs> and Masha, you will moderate the questions. I suppose. <laughs> Thank you.